Okay, let me first introduce uh, the moderator today. Uh, this is Susie, uh, Suzanne Zavarovsky. Uh, she serves the uh, U.S. Department of, uh, Department of Energy in the Office of Nuclear Energy as senior advisor. And in her role, uh, she serves as the liaison between the office and the uh, Secretary of Energy and the White House. Um, she has been one of the uh, most visionary person uh, I've ever met <laughs> uh, in nuclear uh, sector. Uh, she has been helping us uh, not only uh, advocate nuclear energy, but also has been very proactive in, uh, uh, especially in the public sector, in outreaching nuclear uh, energy to public. So, uh, you know, I, she is the one who created this uh, uh, very important and uh, uh, impactful event called Millennial Nuclear Caucus, uh, where uh, young people gather gathers together and then uh, uh, you know have a conversation about nuclear and the future of nuclear energy. So, and uh, more importantly, she's a Hoosier, and also she is a proud proud mom of three boiler makers. So it is. Uh, <laughs> So it, is, uh, it gives me a distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, to you all, as a moderator for today's panel, uh, Mrs. Suzanne Zaborowski. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you, students, staff, faculty, for being here. It's my pleasure and a great honor to be here at Purdue. I'm, I'm super impressed with Purdue. And, and like Dr. Kim said, I have three of my four children. 75% of my kids are Boilermakers. So I know for sure from firsthand uh, experience what a great school Purdue is and the bright future that each of you has in front of you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having all of us, this distinguished panel here today, and also for hosting um, back in March when Dr. Kim had us here. And, and I would say the same about Dr. Kim. He is a visionary leader. He's an enthusiastic leader for the nuclear engineering department. He's been a great host and a great friend to me. So thank you so much. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce this great panel today. And I would like to, uh, invite each of you to please be interactive with this panel. This is what will make this experience uh, the best for everyone here in this room, is if you feel comfortable asking questions. And there's no stupid question to ask. Every question that comes into your mind might be something that someone else is thinking of also. So please feel free to ask these very reputable people here who have great experiences to share. Ask them the questions, and I want to point out I brought some um, pictures of what nuclear will look like in the future, uh, how small modular reactors will be integrated into different scenarios. And the first five people to ask questions of the panel will be able to take their pick of those pictures and take them home. So I hope that that will encourage you even more to be open and, and ask some questions. So I want to introduce our panel. And the way that we'll do this is I'll introduce each person. And then each person will have a few minutes to talk about what they do and give you some framework for their experiences and where they see nuclear going in the future in the next 150 years. Uh, Purdue has made great contributions to the area of nuclear engineering and engineering in our world world. And so having these folks here to talk about what's coming in the future is a great honor. So you heard Bill Magwood's uh, credentials and heard about him and all that he's done having been the NE1, which is the leader of the Office of Nuclear Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. He also served as a commissioner on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and now is the Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency out of Paris. And uh, more importantly than all of his credentials, um, I've had the pleasure to introduce Bill in the past and I can also say that he's not just had a lot of titles, he's done a lot of things that have produced a lot of results. And so some of the significant things that he's done that have created results have been to develop nuclear engineering university program funding and scholarships that have turned out people who've made a difference in the world. And so Bill just doesn't hold titles, he's created results. So we're thrilled to have Bill Magwood here. And then, uh, Tim Hanley. Tim is uh, with Exelon. He has served, uh, he is the Senior Vice President of Operations Support for Exelon. Uh, 
Mr. Hanley is currently a senior VP. He is responsible for corporate functional areas that provide governance and oversight to 23 reactors in the Exelon fleet. Prior to his current role, Tim worked for Exelon's nuclear operations lead on matters related to public policy issues associated with nuclear plant operations. Tim works closely with Exelon's Government and Regulatory Affairs and Public Policy Group, providing his operational knowledge and expertise on various current and future public policy issues related to nuclear operations. Previously, Mr. Hanley was a Senior Vice President for West Operations. He was responsible for Exelon Generations Dresden and Quad City stations and had executive oversight for the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Station, which Exelon operates but is owned by Omaha Public Power District. Previously, he held positions as Senior Vice, Site Vice President um, and also served as the Director of Engineering at Dresden and the Director of Midwest Operations, Warrenville, Illinois. His career has mainly been spent in roles of increasing responsibility at Quad Cities. Hanley holds a Master's of Business Administration from St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa, and a Bachelor's Degree in Nuclear Engineering from Purdue University. Welcome, Tim Hanley. Thanks, Susie. <clears throat> Next, we have Therese Griebel. Therese is Deputy Associate Administrator for Programs for the Space Technology Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Therese Griebel began serving as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Programs within the Space Technology Missions Directorate, the STMD, at NASA headquarters in June 2017. In this capacity, she provides executive leadership and management of the technology programs within STMD with an annual investment of approximately $600 million. She's responsible for budget planning and allocation of resources and serves as the final decisional authority for project content, ensuring that technology investments align with the NASA strategic plans and roadmaps. Therese began her career at Glenn in 1991. In 2002, she established and managed the technology program for advanced radioisotope power conversion technologies at NASA, headquarters in Washington, D.C. From 2003 to 2005, she was the technology manager and deputy spacecraft manager for Prometheus Project at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in Pasadena, California. So this is a little bit of Big Bang Theory happening here in real life. Prometheus was envisioned by the first nuclear electric propulsion deep space mission for NASA. From 2007 to 2010, she was the chief of Glenn's manufacturing division that fabricated, instrumented, and assembled the upper stage simulator for Ares uh, I through X, 1 through 10, launched in October 2009 as the first test flight for the Ares 1 vehicle. A native of Northeast Ohio, Therese is the recipient of several NASA awards, including the Outstanding Leadership Medal. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and a Master's of Business Administration from Cleveland State University in Cleveland. Welcome, Therese Griebel. Next, we have our friend, uh, Professor Leftiri Sukakalkas. Uh, he's a professor and former head of the School of Nuclear Engineering at Purdue. He holds a PhD from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and has over three decades of experience in IA methodologies uh, with over 250 research publications in the area, including a book entitled Fuzzy and Neutral Approaches in Engineering. Dr. Sukakis is the founding director of Purdue's AI Labs, AISL, and has served in advisory and consulting positions for the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. The Agency for Space Technology and Research of the Government of Singapore and the U.S. Department of Energy. He's a fellow of the American Nuclear Society. In 2009, he was awarded the Humboldt Prize, Germany's highest honor for international scientists. Welcome, Professor Stukakis. Thank you. And last but surely not least, uh, we have a student representative, I think probably among the most important voice that we have on the panel today, to be able to shape what the reality is for the future of nuclear. We have so Sophie Weidenbenner. 
Did I say that right? Okay, welcome Sophie. She's currently a senior in nuclear engineering at Purdue University. She supports she, at Purdue, she supports work done by the Applied Intelligence Systems Laboratory, working with Dr. Sue Caucus, uh, on projects funded through the Consortium for Nonproliferation Enabling Capabilities. Sophie has completed two internships at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which I can tell you that's a very impressive uh, experience to have, where she has participated in the LANL Keeping Nonproliferation keep in nonproliferation summer school. She has also served as an ambassador for the School of Nuclear Engineering for the past two years. Please welcome Sophie. And with that, I'd like to have each panelist give a little bit of a preview and discussion about your experience. Bill? I feel like I've already talked too much today. Um, well, as you heard, I, I've spent um, the, the first, well, I spent the first part of my career in the industry. Um, I worked at Westinghouse when I came out of school and um, then moved to Washington and became involved in the electric utility business. I worked for a trade association called the Edison Electric Institute, which is where I most became involved in policy before moving to uh, DOE, where as I shared with Susie today, I, I still stand as the longest serving political appointee in DOE history. Uh, where I was there 11 years, uh, seven years of which I ran uh, the Civilian Nuclear Technology Program. And it was really during that period that um, I, I probably gave the most, the deepest thought to, you know, the future and what was needed. And at the time, it was very clear to me that uh, laying the groundwork for young people to come into the nuclear business was absolutely essential to the future. Um, and as I, as I think I shared in the, in the mid-90s, this was really in question. There were a lot of people who thought that the whole discipline of nuclear engineering was, was phasing out and we would see it go away. And it's not far-fetched because we, we've lost disciplines. You know, we've lost, essentially, there's, there's, so, there's so little um, radiochemistry opportunities for training um, around, around um, the United States today. So it's really depressing. And there's other disciplines where we also have lost a lot of capacity. So nuclear engineering could have gone that way. Unfortunately, it didn't because it enabled us to, um, to see all of you here today and to be talking about what the future might be. Um, my time at NRC was much more of a time where I thought much more about safety than I had in the past. I used to, I used to joke that, you know, for example, my job was to make nuclear waste, not worry about cleaning it up. So I do worry about nuclear waste a lot more now than I did back then. And, um, and I think that over the years, I've been able to see that um, now that I'm particularly with an international organization, that the problems that we see are not um, unique to any country. They really are global problems. They're the same issues, country after country, situation after situation we have to face. And so I guess the perspective that I have now is that we have a shared future and certainly countries like the U.S. can display a lot of leadership, but it's got to be leadership on behalf of the whole global population, not, not, just, not just us. It's got to be um, part of the overall achievement of humankind. And I think that that's the kind of perspective that perhaps we once had but it's so much harder to do today because everyone is so constrained in terms of money and time and uh, attention. And um, so I think we have to get back to thinking in terms of those save the world, save the future kind of, of, of ethos um, that I think we once had back when people like Neil Armstrong uh, were thinking about taking those first steps. You know, those things like that don't happen without vision. And I think that's the, what we have to recreate, that, that sense of vision, that sense of purpose, and that sense of direction. Thanks, Bill. Tim? Thanks, Susie. Um, as Susie mentioned, I spent my entire career with Exelon, or prior to that, it was Commonwealth Edison, through a series of mergers, um, you know, became the entity that we are today. Um, you know, we talk a lot, <clears throat> and Bill mentioned the financial pressures on a lot of nuclear plants, and what, you know, people may not realize that is actually a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, you know, actually the week prior to Fukushima, we were at a meeting that was talking about the nuclear renaissance. There was gonna be 30 new reactors under construction being built. Um, you know, the NRC staffed up because they're gonna to have to be reviewing so many new licenses. 
And two things happen, and everybody thinks a lot about the Fukushima, but that really wasn't what drove the issue. The two things that happened was horizontal drilling and fracking. Um, th that drove down the price of natural gas to the point where, um, and I, I could go on and on about the markets, but drove down the price of natural gas that took away the high end of how we were making money. When the, when it used to be when you brought a natural gas plant on, that set the market and we were making a bunch of money. With low cost natural gas, that drove that down. Along with that, the large influx of renewables that were put on the grid without really looking at how they would impact the grid took away the low end. So there are times at some of our plants there is so much unneeded wind energy congesting the transmission system, we see negative pricing for the electricity that the nuclear plants are making. So essentially we are paying to produce that electricity over that time period, even though it's clear you need that nuclear plant energy when the wind goes away and it is gonna go away. So the unpredictability of the renewables being put on the grid at places that weren't well engineered, um, you know, hit us on the low end. So those two things really squeezed the profits significantly, particularly for the commercial nuclear power plants, the ones that are not part of a regulated utility. So that really all came together less than 10 years ago. So it's relatively new, but the losses can be so large. You see a lot of, of companies getting out of the uh, commercial nuclear business if they're not part of their regulated utility. And that's why you see so many plant closings. Um, so, you know, my, my vision of the future for nuclear is kind of twofold. One is whatever there is, whatever we're gonna build, whatever's gonna be out there in 150 years has to be much more flexible. The plants we have now are generally designed to be base load plants. We have a little bit of operating margin and we actually um, in Exelon load follow some of our plants now um, within certain constraints. Um, maybe interesting if you, you know, when I was actually a nuclear engineer 31 years ago at Quad Cities, we would put the plant in what was called economic generation control. We would set limits on the research pump speeds. We'd push a button and the load dispatcher in Lombard, Illinois would actually control the power of the reactor. I'm pretty sure the NRC would never ever license that again. Um, but what it does, it also means you're not operating at full power. You can't allow it to ramp all the way to full power. So you give up some of that, that top end. So um, there is some flexibility, but whatever there is in the future has got to be more compatible with the intermittent renewables that I think are gonna be a larger and larger part of the portfolio. The second part is, I think they have to be more inherently safe. And from that standpoint is we've always accepted with the current type of reactors that we have that the fuel, if not cooled, can melt. And everything, all the designs put into that and the safety systems are to ensure that we don't leave the fuel without cooling. I, I think the technology we should be pursuing, and, and Bill mentioned accident tolerant fuel, create a fuel that can't melt. Once you do that, not only does it lower the cost of the nuclear power plant, the people become much more accepting of it because you no longer hear the core melt scenario, which becomes so scary to so many people. So I think 150 years from now, um, you know, those two hurdles should be fairly easily overcome. And if we're really gonna meet our goals for both environmental and uh, energy security, nuclear has gotta be a big part of that. Thanks, Tim. Therese? Thanks, Susie. So, um, as Susie said, I'm from NASA, and NASA is going forward to the moon and then to Mars and beyond with humans. And uh, this is, in, is consistent with the President of the United States uh, uh, space policy directives that he signed almost a year ago. Um, and the, one, the first space policy directive is to have sustainable uh, existence of humans it, at the moon and beyond. And the sustainability is really going to necessitate higher power uh, systems. And so um, the expectation is that we will have to have like a surface power reactor in order to survive the lunar night. I mean, sustainability may, probably means more than a week, right? So, so the, the nuclear surface power reactor will be necessary for sustainability and the nuclear, and, and we're also developing um, 
nuclear thermal propulsion systems within my organization. So NASA is organized into four mission directorates. One's aeronautics, that's the first uh, A in NASA. The other three have to do with space. Uh, one is science, which is all those really fancy science missions, robotic missions where we see JPL uh, landing rovers or doing flybys um, in, in deep space. Uh, and Goddard Space Flight Center does more of the Earth observing ones. And then the Human Exploration Mission Directorate does the human operations where we operate with astronauts at the International Space Station and hopefully go back to the moon and beyond. Um, the fourth mission directorate is the one that I am in, which is the Space Technology Mission Directorate. And when we do missions um, in the Science Mission Directorate and the Human Exploration Mission Directorate, usually they're cost capped and they are uh, very rigorously managed. We're not allowed to have, it, it's not acceptable to have failures, it's not acceptable to exceed certain costs and you can't miss your launch date because usually, Mar well, because Mars doesn't stay where it is and nothing stays where it is in space. So um, what we do in the Space Technology Mission Directorate is we develop those technologies in advance of them being necessary for uh, meeting the mission and objectives and the vision of, of the president. And so um, we are doing all manner of technology development. We have five themes. It's go, live, go, land, live, explore, and prosper. And go has to do with transportation. Landing is safely getting there. Um, exploring and living have to do with the life support systems and the instruments that are necessary. And prosper really has to do with the commercialization. How do we get a commercial market to benefit from going on these exploration missions? And so within this, the portfolio of technologies that I manage, they're very low technology readiness level all the way up through flight demonstrations. And within my portfolio right now, the two major nuclear things, one is the nuclear surface power technology that um, hopefully we'll be able to flight demonstrate in the mid 2020s and the nuclear thermal propulsion development in order to reduce trip time to get humans to Mars uh, to hopefully reduce the amount of radiation they're exposed to and improve their life uh, and their health. So. Thank you, Therese. Left Terry? Um, thank you, Suzanne, for the leadership and the rejuvenating and revitalizing leadership that you bring uh, to our campus and our community and the national community. Um, I also like to thank Bill Magwood. Uh, Director General Magwood uh, is an old friend from about 20 years ago when he really did a lot more than I could talk about in the uh, limited time we have about nuclear engineering education and nuclear universities in the United States. Uh, I hope sometime in the future somebody puts this in a history book uh, because it's an interesting, compelling story of leadership. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Professor Kim for his leadership. Uh, is uh, leading our school and together with uh, Suzanne and uh, the people at DOE are really providing a vision now. They're formulating a vision. And I guess this is what we're here to, to, to look, to look at the future as a form of vision. The future is elusive and as a lot of you know, those who live by the glass ball uh, are destined to eat glass. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this exercise uh, in part as an AI exercise. So I'll talk about five things. First, how we formulate the future as a function of the past and the present. So we need to know where we are and where we have come, how we have gotten here, and why we do this. Why is the future so important for us? Why do we talk about 150 years later? Second, how we look at the future, what kind of uh, lens, what kind of telescope we use for the future. And uh, third, what's the role in the future of AI? AI is sort of the, uh, will be, has been, but will be much more so 150 years into the future, the, the, the guardian angel of nuclear technology. And that's important for the, this, the third reason, which is that with AI, we can ensure the stability of global arrangements vis-a-vis -vis nuclear. That is, we address an non-proliferation problem, not at the expense of uh, nuclear energy, but in order to promote nuclear energy and make it available uh, for humanity. We do know that in the foreground of our future, 
nuclear is there and that's very comforting. It's great to know that we can cover the needs of humanity for the next 10,000 years or so. Um, the third thing has to do with the, some of the particulars of this guardianship, the angelic guardianship. You know, how, what would nuclear technology and especially nuclear energy look like about 150 years from now? And the fifth uh, has to do with the, the broad role of AI in nuclear that uh, spawns the health and uh, happiness. Uh, you know, we're going through a revolution now in, uh, uh, due to the genome, uh, in, in, in health, in imaging. A lot of this has to do with uh, the advancements, you know, that uh, uh, visualization allows us to do and nuclear technology at the research all the way to the clinical level. Um, so, if I can take a moment for the first, the bridge to the future. Uh, we look at the future because the future is an infrastructure for generating meaning in our lives. Uh, the future is where we all know we're here for a limited period of time, but humanity will be there, and contributing to humanity is making our lives meaningful, making our efforts disciplined and focused. So the future could be fantasy as in entertainment, which is a wonderful thing for certain things, but it could also be approached rationally. So the question is then, how do we look at the future? Obviously, for the engineers, for the scientists, we know that 150 years down the road is not a linear extrapolation from the present. It's too far out. But think about it for a moment. There were people here 150 years ago that almost about 150 years ago that called themselves Purdue students and Purdue faculty. How was their world? It was not uh, the same as today, but it was not so different. They knew about, uh, in the 1870s, they knew about Maxwell's equations, they knew about statics, about dynamics, they could build bridges, they knew about boiler makers, they could transform <laughs> heat to mechanical work. Uh, they, sure, they didn't know about quantum mechanics, they didn't know about nuclear physics and maybe uh, semiconductors and so forth. You need modern physics for that. But I bet in about a year they could manage and they could learn a lot of what we do know today to be updated, to be, to be like uh, most of us here. So that means that 150 years from now, we look at this, we, we create this telescope and we start from the present and the past for this telescope. And in order to, to get there, the material for the lenses and the telescope to the future has to be mostly developmental principles. They, there are developmental principles that guide our relation to humanity and society, like the great uh, cultural anthropologist uh, Tadao Umezao, the Japanese anthropologist, the Kyoto University professor. He studied the nomadic uh, populations, the relations with nature, uh, was able to categorize and create a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of interesting perspectives and frameworks for history and for what we call now information society. We look at developmental principles that affect our internal world, like uh, Heinz, uh, Heinz Werner's developmental principles around the personality and the cognitive development with the principle of ontogenesis. And so when we we look at the future because that is what generates meaning for our life. We, the way we do it is through the lenses of science. I mean, we can do it through, science, through fantasy, but you know, science and, and developmental principles. And when we do that as an exercise, we will see that AI will be the connecting material for a lot of the pieces of the puzzle that are missing for us today to make nuclear science and technology safe for the global arrangements, but also for the needs of humanity. So as far as the global arrangements, I think in about 150 years from now, we would have uh, artificial intelligence holding a lot of things together in what would be a global monitoring system, a kind of global radar system that could track nuclear materials of interest from cradle to grave. And that's not a small, did to achieve, but I think it's possible, it will be done. 
uh, we're in some ways working today in some of these key uh, elements of the problem, but doing this, uh, we will make non-proliferation more robust and stronger, and at the same time, help us to utilize nuclear fuels, the nuclear fuel cycle for the production of energy with no fear that there will be diversions and non-proliferation activities that lead to uh, weaponry. So, AI will ensure the global arrangements vis-a-vis -vis non proliferation but also contribute to a new generation of uh, power machines, small or large, like uh, Director General Magwood uh, described, like uh, Tim Hendley uh, also uh, you know, described. There'll be flexibility, uh, no core meltdowns, maybe a lot more load following, a convergence of AI, big data, and quantum computing will probably revolutionize the way that energy is distributed as a service more so than as a commodity uh, with the economics of uh, you know, price-directed demand, you know, being, uh, feeding signals uh, for nuclear to operate in a far more flexible and distributed way. So uh, that's there. Then the fourth thing, uh, I mean the fifth thing and the last thing, uh, AI will be there in uh, creating a, a virtual, I should say, a data space for each human being that comes to Earth, that leaves behind not just the birth records and the educational degrees and so forth, but a lot of the health, uh, you know, information, a blood of, uh, I mean, a, a drop of blood at the moment of birth will probably give a lot of guidance for how uh, this person can can live and what to watch out. We will have longer lifespans, uh, healthier people, more productive. Uh, to do this, AI will be also part of the education of these individuals. So, in cyberspace, there will be a, a virtual sort of self with a lot of this data all around it that includes health and education and, you know, commercial activities, etc., habits, uh, the things you know that Google collects data from. Uh, but also, and I think it more importantly, it will be also a, a, a tool for looking into, for connecting and living significant contributions of the individual in, for the future, for the for the generations that come. And especially in nuclear, this is very important because we're talking about a, a knowledge that spans, will span decades, technologies that will last for about 100 years or so. And so having the capacity to, to be in a, a dialogue with previous generations and to leave knowledge for future generations will be one of the extraordinary accomplishments of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Lefteri. Sophie. Thanks. So, um, as a student on this panel, uh, my role today is basically just to share my perspective on the future of nuclear energy. Um, so I figured the best way to do that would be to start out by sharing how I came to choose nuclear engineering as my career, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the perspectives that I've gained so far as a student. Um, so to start, um, whenever I was a senior in high school, I became intrigued with the idea of working with alternative energy as a career. Um, so that's ultimately what led me to engineering, but back in the day I wasn't too sure on the discipline that I wanted to get into. So some of my uh, classmates that are in the audience today know that I actually started out my college career in chemical engineering. Um, and back then, nuclear engineering was in my mind, I knew about it, but I didn't see it as a practical option. I thought that the job opportunities would be too limited. Um, but towards the end of my freshman year, I started speaking with students and faculty in the Department of Nuclear Eng Engineering. And uh, eventually I came to realize that the industry is actually very vast and it's very exciting. And as my proof of my belief in that, I'm here today as a student ambassador for the School of Nuclear Engineering. Um, and yeah, so ultimately I chose nuclear engineering based on the belief that nuclear energy is a very important alternative energy that we should be uh, pursuing both now and in, in the future. So um, talking a little bit about my experiences so far as a student, um, throughout a lot of my undergraduate career, I've been involved in research that has to do with nonproliferation. Um, and though it may not seem like an obvious jump from working with nuclear nonproliferation and nuclear security towards what I originally wanted to do, which was helping the growth of nuclear energy, um, they actually go hand in hand pretty well from what I've experienced. Um, so through 
my research here at Purdue and through working at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is a place that specializes in nuclear security, um, I've been able to see that the developments being made in uh, nonproliferation are very, very important for the uh, future of nuclear energy. Um, basically, the proliferation risks associated with the industry need to be mitigated in order for nuclear energy to continue into the future. Um, so through my work at Los Alamos, I've been exposed to a lot of projects and research that's currently happening in the field of nonproliferation, and it makes me really excited and hopeful for the future of nuclear energy. Um, and though I'm currently still a student and definitely not an expert on anything nuclear related, um, I am very excited to build a career in this industry and I look forward to helping the future of nuclear energy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So let's turn it over to you. Uh, who's our first question? Yes, ma'am. Do we have any microphones to pass around? Here we go. Sorry, I think I hit that a little soon for you ladies, but they're on it. They're on it. They'll get you a microphone real quick. So uh, a big problem that has been addressed in a lot of your spe um, speeches has been simply the cost of developing new nuclear energy. So in your opinions, what needs to change with the economic and political climates to make nuclear energy more attainable? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> well for, first, let me think of them. Yeah, we're good. Well, one thing I would, I, I would sort of echo what Mr. Hanley just said a few minutes ago about, about the nexus between cost and safety. You know, I, I was listening, and, and I think you may, have, you may have used the word inherently safe or something like that. I, I think I would actually turn that around and say what we need is nuclear that's inherently cheap. You know, and because the safety is, is, is a given. If, you, if it's not, if it's not, doesn't have high levels of safety, you're not going to be allowed to operate it anyway. So what you need is, a, is technologies that get you there at much, 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 much lower cost. And um, this, I think, can create a conversation about, about light water reactors. We were having this conversation earlier today. We have a lot of experience with light water reactors. Um, light water, re I, 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 I'll, I'll share with you, I, I had a, I've had a series of conversations with, with people even older than me um, who, who, who have some um, history with the very early days of nuclear, and I've asked this question. And the question I have asked is, um, if you, when you think back about everything you know about what's happened over the last 50 years of the nuclear industry, if you could do it all over again, would you pick light water reactor technology to be the technology for, for nuclear? And almost every one of them, one was more hesitant, but almost every one of them said no, probably would not have chosen light water technology. And, and one of them highlighted to me that if you go back and you look, light water technology was selected only because it already had been developed by the Navy for submarine use, so it was one thing we had, it was there, we were, it was all ready to go, so we were able to implement it quickly. But if you go back and you look at the, you go look back and look at, you know, speeches and, and articles that are written, virtually none of the early pioneers thought that light water was going to really last that long. He thought it was like an in, a, sort of an interim step and they actually all thought it was going to go to sodium cool fast reactors very quickly. That's where they thought the future was. So, so I, I think that part of it is that, um, to me, especially if you look longer term, I, I, I personally do believe that we will move away from light water technology. I think it, it's, it's, it is a technology that's hard to do cheaply. Um, and if we're going to be successful, we have to see the cost levels go down dramatically. Now, before we get to that point where we have revolutionary technologies, we have to operate the, the technologies we have the best we can. And um, I, would, I absolutely agree with what, what, with what he said a few minutes ago about the market situation. For, for the market situation is such that um, today's nuclear plants are going to struggle unless they get some kind of extra help or support or unless those conditions change. So I don't think you can cut costs enough to, to fit into the market as it exists. But what you can do is you can look at um, reducing costs, using big data, artificial intelligence, and other technologies, reducing the cost of operating plants, making better decisions, reducing uh, the regulatory burden, 
You can do all these things, but you're only going to be able to go so far to reduce those costs. Um, the only way to go further is actually the, the change to change the technology. And I, I think ultimately, especially when you look long term, that's what's got to happen. I think all of that's true. I, I think part of the issue is the speed at which we do things, though. You know, the, the plants that were being built in South Carolina that were abandoned and the two in Georgia have now been going on their years past when they're supposed to be, um, you know, done. There are plants in the UAE that were built by a Korean company that were finished, two of them, on time, under budget. They have regulatory issues because they really have no framework to actually load fuel into them, but the actual physical part of the plants are done and were done very well, very cheaply, and again, ahead of time. So it can be done. We're just not very good at it in the United States at this point. The other thing from a speed standpoint, if you look at the time period from Chicago Pile 1, the first human-made sustained nuclear reaction was in 1942. Dresden Unit 1, which was the first commercially financed nuclear reactor, came online in 1960. So that was 18 years from even proving you could do it to have something in commercial operation. We just don't move that fast anymore from a regulatory standpoint, from an industry standpoint. Um, and I think, I was talking to Dr. Kim earlier, the first thing we need to do is start building because what you do, once you build, you learn. And you learn what you did wrong, what you did right. Start small, learn from that, and keep moving forward. But there's been this gigantic you know, gap in actually starting to construct anything that, that we just flounder and redesign on paper. And until you actually start putting you know, concrete down and start putting metal down, that's when you really learn from it. And I think that's the first step is start building something so we can learn from it and get all the things Bill talked about earlier moving, the supply chain, the people's interest, the support. Um, until we do that, I, I think we'll be just struggling to keep the current fleet of plants running. Can I make a really quick comment because a uh, very important point, but I would, has, I would make the note that it's not just nuclear that suffers from that. It re really, if you look at almost any technological industry, it takes vastly longer to design and build almost everything than it did back in, say, the 1960s. I mean, aerospace is very similar. The, the time it takes to put a new, a new plane in the air is, is, is hugely longer than it was when we first started. We, we built 7, I forgot the time of building in 707, but it, it was like a few years. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's like a decadal uh, um, exercise to design a new airline. So it's not just, it's not just nuclear. It's, it's really how we do engineering. Um, it's how we do projects in the modern world. So there's a, there's a challenge here, though. You have a good question about how do we bring the cost down and uh, timing and longevity and repeating and getting out there and just doing it um, is the answer we're hearing. But, Sophie, I would be interested from your point of view because in your generation, uh, look at what's happened just in the last few years when if there's a need for an app, that app gets developed right away. If there's a new opportunity, you've had... How many different cell phone iterations has everybody in this room had? We've seen technology move extremely quickly for your generation. So your expectations must be not in line with 17, 18, 20 years to build something that can be done. Can you make a comment about that time frame? Yeah, that's um, very interesting. So like you guys are all hitting on the past and we're seeing a trend there. Um, I don't know, just being a part of my generation, it, it's different with technology nowadays and the way it's progressing. Um, I mean, I think, it's, I think we're hopeful for the future for using the way tech, we're using technology now to see if we can apply it and uh, make things speed up, as you, were, as you were saying. And if I could just add to that, what I'm seeing is the shift in the evolution of the product line, if you will, in nuclear. It is getting much smaller and thus less expensive. Uh, the first one, of course, is still extremely expensive compared to some other fuel sources. But as we move from a large AP1000 type product product to a small modular reactor or a micro reactor, which the Department of Defense is looking at putting on all of the uh, military facilities all around the world, that kind of smaller, evolved 
product, if you will, makes it a more um, affordable proposition. And then being able to have the government be the first purchaser and place many of them all around the world will help drive the cost down is, is part of the plan too. So thank you for your question. Other questions? Uh, yes, orange shirt next. Sorry to call you orange shirt, but that's. Got a Tennessee shirt. <laughs> you can sit down. You've got that Tennessee shirt. No, I'm just joking. That's okay. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you guys for coming out today. Um, you guys have touched on nuclear nonproliferation. I know Dr. Sukalis, you talked about uh, the future of AI in tracking fuels. Um, but as we become a more global society and nuclear technology spreads, uh, that opens the door for new possibilities for uh, terrorists or other state actors to get their hands on weapons-grade plutonium, uranium, and other materials. Um, what are some of the uh, challenges you think industry faces uh, in tackling these issues? And is this something that um, is going to go away after a while, or is this something that's always going to be an issue for industry to, to uh, overcome? Good question. Thank you. Well, for, from the industry standpoint, um, I mean, we never handle uranium that's weapons-grade. We're limited by um, NRC regulations, the enrichment we can put in. To, to the fuel, which is not certainly even close to weapons grade. And really neither is the plutonium. Um, plutonium is just easier to make a bomb out of than uranium-235. My view on this has always been, if somebody has the technology to take spent nuclear fuel and transport it, disassemble it, uh, turn it back into something where they can run it through a centrifuge to make it into bomb grade plutonium, they probably don't need the spent nuclear fuel. You know, there's, there's others, they, they could just go get raw uranium, right? I mean, if they've got truly the technology and the capability of taking spent nuclear fuel and, and getting it all the way to bomb grade, they're going to get it from just getting raw uranium. So I, I think that, that part of it, the, the real concern to me would be using it as just a radioactive source. Um, but even that is very, very difficult because the person, ha the, whoever's doing it has to have the technology to get it without killing themselves, right? And, and again, if you have that kind of technology, you probably have the capability of doing something just as damaging without going through all that trouble. All of our spent nuclear fuel is protected just like the reactor is protected. And if you've ever been to an operating nuclear plant, there is probably no more secure, physically secure, private location in the United States. And so uh, while I agree it's something that we always have to keep mindful of, I think anybody with that capability could do something just as damaging without going to all the trouble to get spent nuclear fuel. So um, we had a discussion with some young women engineers earlier this morning, and one of the things that kind of came up was how the public perception of the dangers of nuclear and proliferation of obviously is one of them. And so um, I checked into like, what would we do with our nuclear reactors if we were to use them in space, right? And so um, if we had a surface reactor, say on Mars, um, we're anticipating a total of about 40 watts, 40 kilowatts is necessary in order to operate kind of a human kind of colony uh, on Mars. Um, after about 10 years, which is the life of the reactor, it's not the life of the uranium. It's, we only would have depleted about 1% of it, but the reactor lifetimes expect to be about 10 years or a little more. Um, when we shut down the reactor, uh, within a day it'll be at ambient temperature, and then within a few months, robots can access it, and humans can go for short periods of time, and within a year, it'll be similar to the kind of radiation that you get in the natural space environment. And so, um, and the expect, so some people have talked about maybe stockpiling these reactors somewhere on Mars so that they can keep it all together in a way. And um, we don't think we're going to build that many reactors on Mars. That we're not going to continue to have big plants and stuff on Mars. But there are some of the architectural people who are working on architects to get, um, to, to get people to Mars and to do some exploration. Um, they are thinking about utilizing maybe some of the spent uh, fuel to radiate bio waste. So, um, relative, also our planetary protection people have said that the the amount of radiation that will result at the end of life at at this at after the 10 years and after it cools down is going to be similar to what the Mars Curiosity rover 
MMRT, uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, uh, what the plutonium-238 is going to be. And so that's, it's a 100 watt plutonium-238, uh, one radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So for the most part, and on the moon, there's nothing really we think that we're going to damage. There's not a lot of life there. There are some deep space science missions where, um, say, we were going to do a high power nuclear electric propulsion system to go to the icy moons of Jupiter. Uh, when we were developing that system, the idea at that time and the approval was that we would, after we visited each of the three moons of Jupiter that had the scientific interest to us, um, we would allow the spacecraft just to go into Jupiter because there's, we just, the, the radiation of the reactor doesn't even register compared to the radiation at Jupiter. So those are the kinds of things that we've thought about in the missions that we're conceiving. Thank you. And, um, it's... It's really extraordinarily difficult from spent fuel from power reactors to make nuclear bombs because it's not just plutonium-239 there and the other isotopes of plutonium are in, uh, relatively speaking, uh, in proportions that, uh, you know, in nuclear weaponry it's called, uh, we don't, you don't have formula material, you know, they're, they're, the other isotopes of plutonium act as contaminants. However, since the 1970s, in the United States, in Washington, the prevailing view is that non-proliferation is priority, has priority over nuclear power. And more or less since the late 70s, everything is looked through the prism of non-proliferation. Why? Because if you have the know-how, if you have the laboratory and industrial infrastructure for working with spent fuel, then you can do the other stuff. You know, you can get small reactor fuel, you know, you can do the kind of things that the North Koreans have done. So, uh, AI in that sense would be very, very useful in integrating the various modalities, the various sensing we have available, not just Geiger counters, we can get in here, you know, spectro spectrographic data from satellites about uh, noble gases and noble gas isotopes, neutrinos, uh, the power grid, uh, you know, noise from the environment, what we call background, all of these patches of sensing, none of which are really in themselves capable of allowing us to track materials of interest from cradle to grave, when we sim them together, and AI is the way to do this, they can provide and they will provide for us a kind of global radar system for nuclear materials. In that sense, we will have a lot of confidence that we strengthen the international arrangements which, for which it's very pivotal. Non-proliferation is extraordinarily, it's much more uh, than what meets the eye. Non-proliferation is really the, the foundation of the international arrangements. I just tell you, I recall for you, that the permanent fives, the, the, the most important members of the UN, are countries that did a nuclear test before January 1st, 1967, right? Uh, so we can strengthen non-proliferation by developing this intelligent global monitoring system, and by strengthening non-proliferation and the international arrangements, the global system, we can really make it a lot easier to use nuclear technology in secure but flexible ways. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> We've mentioned it a few times now on a new technology, a new technology coming in and a new type of reactor. But if we look back on things like EBR2 at INL, we had a passively safe reactor that could shut down during LOCA instance a reactor that could uh, recycle its fuel on site and it was still shut down to political um, needs at the time or views at the time. And so if we were to have a new system implemented, would the regulatory bodies and licensing communities be able to sh have a paradigm shift along with that to tackle the problem in a different manner than we currently are? Great question. Let, let me address that because I, I was there when this happened. And um, it was just a huge mistake. I mean, we, we knew it at the time. A lot of people argued against it. Um, the technology you're referring to, we call the integral fast reactor, um, to this day is probably the most advanced um, proliferation-resistant um, technology 
create it, even today, all these years later. Nothing is more advanced than what we were doing um, in the U.S. at that time. Um, so it was obviously a mistake. And, but it was, as you pointed out, it was a political consideration, which actually was a link directly to nonproliferation, by the way. The, the story was that there were people who believed that even though you could demonstrate uh, the technology to be proliferation resistant, the fact that it was recycling um, inherently encouraged other people to recycle, and they might use a technology that wasn't as proliferation resistant, and we wanted to be in a position to say, don't do that, and not hear someone say, no, but you're doing what you're doing in Idaho, so you, should, you, should, you can't tell us what to do. So that's the, the political context of that. Um, so if we were to go down this path, uh, a path again, um, I don't think the regulator is the big issue. I think the biggest issue is um, understanding how a technology like that would fit into the overall energy framework. And what is the role of, of a fast neutron facility that's recycling nuclear material that way. And it's not an exactly, it's not exactly an obvious question right now. I, I talk to countries like France and Japan that are still thinking about fast reactors in the future. And that's something I think they're starting to reconsider. Do you consider fast reactors to be a technology where we might need, say in the US, 30 or 40 fast reactors? Or is it the technology where in the US we might need two fast reactors just to manage the back end of the fuel cycle? It's a, it's a question I think is, is still kind of open. So I, I don't think the regulators are a problem. I think what you would find is that the regulators only need enough lead time to begin to gear up, um, acquire the expertise to be able to address um, the regulatory responsibilities. And um, I'll, I'll give you a very solid example. When we were going through the exercise of um, looking at advanced um, isotope production facilities, one of the facilities that was being proposed was by B&W, and it was a liquid fuel reactor. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, right? And, um, and I saw the NRC staff immediately launch into action to start collecting information and, and, and very quickly had convinced themselves that they could see a path where this was going to, to happen. Do I think it was going to be easy? Not necessarily, but there wasn't, a, there wasn't no resistance to doing it. Um, but what we need in the longer term is a framework that is more conducive to licensing these events, non-light water technologies. We don't have that today. Um, they're talking about launching in that path um, now. If we don't do that, we have to use 10 CFR Part 50 and use a lot of exemptions. It gets very complicated and very messy. You can do it, but um, I think the preference would be to have a new framework. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I would invite you, if you have the time, to stay after and talk to the panelists who are able to stay. I know. Therese has to get to the airport and catch a flight, but if the rest of you can stay and be available for some follow-up questions, we would appreciate it. So I think um, also for those of you who asked questions, make sure to stop by and choose one of your pictures, and uh, we'll try to um, find someone else who might be interested because I think we'll have two more extra. So uh, thank you so much for your very thoughtful questions. I, I just want to reiterate, I think the future is very bright for you. I am appreciative of uh, your attendance here and being so engaged. And thank you so much to our distinguished guests. It was an incredible opportunity to hear them. Thank you.